Shalom. Welcome back to our series. I'm Dr. Noreen Jacks with Bible Interact. I'm happy you've joined again for the next session. I've been studying Moses' tabernacle for about 35 years, and I'm never tired of it. It's a fascinating topic, and I hope that you are seeing it as that also. Um, our, our subject is the Gospel according to Moses, a study of the tabernacle in the wilderness. We are at session five today, which is the brazen altar, the place where sin was judged. Having had a brief overview of the tabernacle and its unique function among the Israelite sojourners in the wilderness, it's now time to begin our virtual pilgrimage in earnest. The words of Yeshua in John chapter 10, verse one, come to memory. I tell you for certain that only thieves and robbers climb over the fence instead of going in through the gate of the sheep pen. This verse reminds us that there's only one way to salvation, only one way to heaven, only one path that leads to eternal life. All other paths lead to destruction. Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14 addresses this. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. In days of antiquity, there was a universal custom known as Threshold Covenant. This was an agreement made between two former enemies or strangers that would make them covenant partners for life. A ceremonial blood sacrifice known as the Cutting of the Covenant was the key factor in the ritual, which was followed by a celebratory covenant meal that always included bread and wine. Covenants were cut at the threshold of the home, the same place where the household idols and amulets were placed or buried. Only those who were in covenant relationship with the family would dare to cross the threshold, lest they anger the protective deity. If a thief wanted to break in and steal, he would climb through a window, he might slash the tent curtains, or even tunnel underneath the curtain, rather than risk the curse of the threshold god. It was because of this superstitious worldview that Yeshua indicated that thieves and robbers would prefer to climb over a fence rather than to enter through the door. Here we see an image of Yeshua in John chapter 10, verse 9, where he says, I am the door of the sheepfold. One of my favorite images of Yeshua as the good shepherd. While discussing shepherding, Yeshua also stated that he is the door of the sheepfold and that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, unlike the hiring who fails to defend the flock from danger. Over here now you see this um, image of the sheepfold at the Nazareth village in Israel. This is a wonderful recreated village from the time of Christ that I urge you to see if you've not already done so or give me a call and come on our next tour. We would love to take you. You can contact me at BibleInteract.com or at NoreenJax.com. There's nothing like a tour of the Holy Land to make the Bible come to life. It makes it become like a pop-up book. Now, in Bible times, shepherds commonly slept at the entrance to the sheepfold to prevent marauders or animals from entering. The shepherd's presence at the gate also precluded the sheep from wandering off in the wee hours should they awaken during the night. The shepherd's body was in guard mode at the threshold while he slept. No thief or animal could enter that protected place without first crossing over his body, which was an unlikely occurrence. Here's another image of the shepherd guarding the sheepfold at the Nazareth village. And in John 10, 11, we read, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Yeshua is the good shepherd. He is the one who willingly down, laid down his life. As such, he is the threshold guardian of the tabernacle, of the temple, of heaven, and of his sheepfold, even right here while we're on earth. No assailant would dare approach those heavily guarded gates and no one would be foolish enough to tunnel under or rip the curtains of the tabernacle. 
Only God's covenant partners are authorized to cross the sacred threshold into his glorious presence. As covenant partners with the Almighty and with his beloved Son, we are welcome to enter the one and only gate that leads to life everlasting. Come with me now into the outer court. As kings and priests of the Most High God, we have been granted VIP access. The Hebrew term for altar is mitzbiach. Here you see on your screen the brazen altar at Moses Tabernacle display in Timna Park, very close to the border of Egypt. The guide is there pointing out the four horns of the altar. The Latin term for altar is alta, meaning high. So the high altar was a place where human and animal sacrifices and incense were offered to the pagan deities in antiquity. The altar was a focal point of worship in pagan antiquity, and it was also the focal point of worship among the Jews. The brazen altar in the tabernacle and in the temple was also known as the altar of Olah. This means the altar of burnt sacrifice, which as the sacrifice was offered up to God and consumed and the smoke ascended to him. The term Olah has the literal meaning of that which ascends, particularly in smoke. And it comes from the verb Allah, meaning to ascend. Uh, here we have the term mitzbiach for you to see in Hebrew. I find it's, it's um, helpful to see the word, to pronounce it if you can see it in the transliteration as well as in the Hebraic form. And the word holocaustus from the Greek, meaning wholly burned. Did you know holocaust was a Greek word? Well, now you do. The compound Greek term holocaustus is the source of this word. It's derived from the compound word, uh, from, from two compounds, whole, ho hollow, whole, and costus, meaning to burn. The word provokes an image of a sacrifice that's wholly consumed in flames with the smoke ascending to heaven, ascending to God. The compound Hebrew term aliyah from the same root means to ascend to God. When a religious Jew makes Aliyah, he is ascending to God. He is, in a sense, offering himself as a living sacrifice. Ascending to the city of Jerusalem is also considered making Aliyah. One must go up, up, up to Jerusalem. This is a picture here of the Mount of Olives uh, right in the city of Jerusalem. And uh, it reminds me, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people. Now here in this image, we have a pagan altar of sacrifice in Gezer. And uh, that is my husband being sacrificed. My pastor has a lot of fun with the congregation. He loves to show this picture of my husband being sacrificed. Anyway, jokes aside, altars of sacrifice and worship have been a part of human interaction with deity since the dawn of time. The pagan sacrifice to a pantheon of demon gods, the early patriarchs constructed altars of worship as directed by God. Adam's garments of animal skins indicate that a blood sacrifice had been offered on an altar of repentance and reconciliation in Genesis 3.21. Now we have Abel's acceptable sacrifice. He brought a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord in contrast to the unacceptable offering brought by his brother Cain in Genesis 4.4. 4. And here we have Noah sacrificing unto God when he exited the ark. With a very thankful heart, he built an altar to the Lord in Genesis 8.20. And notice the rainbow in the background. God's promise that he would never again flood the earth with water. Okay, Genesis 12, 7, we have the Lord appearing to Abraham, and he said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So Abraham built this altar of sacrifice when he first encountered the living God of heaven. In Genesis 12, 7, he proceeded then from the Ur of the Chaldees to Bethel, which means house of God, where he built another altar to God. That's in Genesis 26, verse 25. Uh, I'm sorry, this one is about Isaac's altar. Uh, Isaac built an altar when he called on the name of the Lord. And uh, he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug his well. 
Jacob constructed an altar at Bethel in response to God's command in Genesis 31.1. Arise, go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Genesis 35.1. If we were to study all of the altars and covenants of Bible history in depth, we would clearly see God's progressive revelation to humanity. What we witness before us in the tabernacle is the ever-expanding demonstration of God's redemptive love as we humbly approach the brazen altar. This will be our first stop on the way to the Holy of Holies, where the Shekinah glory of the Almighty eagerly awaits our presence. Anticipation builds as we approach with fear and trembling and joyful anticipation. The altar of sacrifice is the first of seven holy objects we will encounter within the court of God, seven being the number of completion and perfection in the Bible. It was on the seventh day that God rested from his creative works, Genesis 2, 3. And if we will approach these two articles of furnishings in the outer court, we will see the holy place and then Beyond that, the Holy of Holies, all of which will be discussed in this study. Now, the rather imposing size of the brazen altar is surprising, but it's large by necessity because it's the largest object in the outer court. It must hold the hefty animals, which includes bills, bulls. We have kosher animals here, bulls, goats, and sheep, and those bulls are big, and, and even the sheep can be quite large. In Exodus 38, 1 through 7, we read God's instructions to Moses. Then he made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide, square, and three cubits high. He made its horns on its four corners, its horns being of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. He made all the utensils of the altar, the pails, and the shovels and the basins, the flesh hooks and the fire pans. He made all of its utensils of bronze. He made up for the altar a grating of bronze network beneath under its ledge, reaching halfway up. He cast four rings on the four ends of the bronze grating as holders for the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. He inserted the poles into the rings on the sides of the altar with which to carry it. He made it hollow with planks. The altar was constructed of acacia wood, shita wood, and covered with bronze. Some of your translations may say covered with brass. And of course, brass or bronze symbolizes judgment in scripture. You recall that Moses lifted up the brass serpent in the wilderness as an antidote for the sins of the people. The serpent symbolized Yeshua, the one who became sin and was lifted up on the cross to bring healing and redemption. Numbers 21 verses 6 and 7 records this. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord, that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made the bronze serpent and set it on a standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Contrary to the other six articles of furniture in the tabernacle, there was no beauty to be seen in the altar of sacrifice. The bloody slaughter of animals and the stench of smoke were repulsive to witness, reminding the people of the high cost of sin and man's need of judgment. The altar was the divinely appointed place for repentance, for reconciliation, for restoration, and for redemption. It was the place where sin was put to death through an innocent substitutionary animal sacrifice. This marked the first step to new life in the spirit. Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2 says, How blessed is he whose transgression is covered, is forgiven rather, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. 
The symbolic wood of the altar. Now, let's talk about that for a moment. I believe the wood uh, was fig wood that was burned. But like the other wooden furnishings in the tabernacle, the brazen altar was constructed of shita wood, the hard, gnarly, tightly grained, incorruptible wood representing Yeshua. Some claim uh, there are wood specimens from the shita tree that are five to 6,000 years old. And in the Bible, wood represents humanity. Shita wood with its unique characteristics speaks of the enduring human nature of Yeshua. Not even the grave could hold him. Interestingly, because the countless thorns on its branches, um, because of them, the shita tree is also known as the thorn tree, giving it prophetic qualities. The tree is adorned with small fragrant blossoms in the spring, the very time of Yeshua's resurrection. The Egyptians used shita wood in the construction of boats because of its enduring strength. Some scholars claim the shita tree was Moses' burning bush, the bush that kept burning but was not consumed. Exodus 3.2 records that. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and yet it was not consumed. The overlaying brass on the altar speaks of divine judgment for sin. In the words of Ezekiel 18.20, we read, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The brazen altar also reminds us that Yeshua took the judgment for sin upon himself, dying in our place. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. The purifying fire of God, very important that we talk about this. God took the children of Israel from Moses' encounter with the divine at the burning bush in Exodus 3 to a blazing mountaintop where the people and the whole earth trembled in his fearsome presence at the giving of the law in Exodus 19 to the altar of sacrifice in the tabernacle where sin was confessed and forgiven to the glowing light of the candlestick, the menorah, that we will encounter when we enter the holy place, and finally to the upper room in Jerusalem, where the fire of Pentecost, the fire of Shavuot, rained down upon the faithful. This is progressive revelation. It's also important to note that fire not only consumes and destroys, it also purifies and ratifies. Adonia was afraid of Solomon, and he rose and he went and he took horns, took hold of the horns of the altar. 1 Kings 150. Even today, we must take hold of the horns of the altar in a spiritual sense, clinging to the faith instilled in us by the power of the Holy Spirit and the mercy of God, while wholly yielding our lives to the Savior. Now let's read Exodus 20, verses 25 and 26. This is the altar of unhewn stone that had to be built on a ramp. If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it of cut stone. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it, and you shall not go up by steps to my altar, so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. Here we have two explicit instructions from God. This altar was to have no cut stones and no steps up to the altar. God strictly forbade the use of steps to access the brazen altar that was situated on a mound of earth, making it higher than the other articles of furnishings. Instead, he commanded that a ramp be constructed as a modesty precaution for the priests who wore loose flowing garments. The brazen altar was constructed of unhewn stone by divine command. Why was God emphatic about this instruction? What was the difference between cut stones and uncut stones in the tabernacle construction? Cut stones represent man's effort to reach God. This reminds us of the man-made bricks rather than natural stones used to build the Tower of Babylon that was an abomination to God. 
Unhewn stones are God-made rather than man-made. Another reminder that there is no humanism in salvation. Man cannot make God in his own image. Man can do nothing to save himself except to repent of his sins. Redemption is the sole work of the Godhead. Now on the left you see Bronze Age swords and tools. The term tool in the aforementioned verse is better translated sword from the Hebrew metal. Uh, from the Hebrew. Uh, metal implements in fleshly hands might result in carved images on the stones which would be an idolatrous act that would bring a curse. So we must also look at the instruments used in cutting stones, these metal implements that could be used as weapons of warfare. I put that photograph there for you to see. They're from the Woodland Museum of Biblical Archaeology in, in Woodland, California, my hometown. If you're ever in the Sacramento area, contact me at uh, woofmuseum.org, wufmuseum.org or at noreenjacks.com. I would love to give you a tour. We're very proud of our museum. Now, a sword, back to the sword. A sword speaks of death and annihilation. It robs one of life prematurely, whereas the altar of God lengthens one's days through God's merciful grace. The little understood command in this passage was given by God for man's protection. The word for tool in that passage is charev, meaning sword, knife, or a tool for cutting stone. When Solomon's temple was under construction, not a sound was heard at the construction site. Out of respect for the sacred project, no tools, no metal implements were allowed. The massive stones were pre-cut away from the Temple Mount and transported to the site for placement after they had been cut and dressed. Here is a replica on your screen of the Second Temple, uh, and this is in Jerusalem. This is a site we like to take our tour groups to. It's fascinating to see this artist's conception of what Israel, what Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, the old city, would have looked like during the period of the Second Temple. Now the altar of sacrifice bore witness to three unceasing miracles. First Kings 6, 7, we learn that the house temple, while it was being prepared, was built of stones, prepared at the quarry, and neither hammer nor axe nor any iron tool was heard in the house while it was being built. Now let me tell you about the miracles that took place when this temple was constructed. The fire burned continuously. It never went out. Remember, this fire had its origin in heaven. The fire was never extinguished by rain, and the smoke ascended heavenward like a pillar in spite of the wind. Praise God. We see the miraculous throughout, all throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, and of course throughout the New Testament as well. In Leviticus 6, verse 12, we read, The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it, it shall not go out, but the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall lay out the burnt offering on it and offer up in smoke the fat portions of the peace offering on it. So the source of the heavenly flame was supernatural. As I said, it originated in heaven. Now we'll look about transporting the portable altar and all that was involved in that. Leviticus 9, 23 and 24 discusses this. Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then the fire came down from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portion of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Now God's blueprint for this altar that we just read about required that two staves, two poles, be made to transport it through the desert. The staves passed through four brass rings that were attached to the altar. The two staves speak prophetically of the two aspects of the gospel of salvation. That's the death and the resurrection of Yeshua, just as you see in this graphic. The death and the resurrection of Yeshua. Just as the altar required two staves for transport, both aspects of the gospel are necessary for salvation. Without Yeshua's sacrificial death, there would be no resurrection. 
Without the resurrection, there would be no salvation. Eternal life is not the result of Yeshua's suffering and death. Many Messianic figures have died for their cause, but only Yeshua rose from the grave. Hebrews 10, 11 to 14 reads, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Praise God. Numerous coverings were placed upon the altar during transport, including a purple covering that was affordable only to royalty and the priesthood. The rich color was derived from the mingling of blue and scarlet. We see the dual nature of Yeshua, the human and the divine, in the sacrificial altar. Yeshua, our righteous high priest and king, was clothed in purple at the time of his scourging and mocking. There's much more on this topic in the workbook. And I hope that you will join us soon for our next session. I hope you're learning. I hope you're growing in the most holy faith. Until we meet again, I bid you farewell in the name of Yeshua, and may he bless you abundantly. Bible Interact is a group of Bible scholars and biblical archaeologists who promote the Hebraic nature of Scripture and view the two Testaments as one unified message. They explain how they use a first century approach to searching the Scriptures, and they share their methods and discoveries for discussion and dialogue. They invite your comments and participation on BibleInteract.tv, where you can also find more teachings, self-study quizzes, webinars, and interviews. 